Welcome back to the second half of the Future Show here on the Schwab Network. We've got less than 60 minutes until the cash open for stocks on Wall Street and checking in on the S&Ps. We're coming off a bit here in reaction to retail sales data hitting the wire as we speak. Let's bring in Bob Iacchino, who's bringing the founder, the Chief Strides of Path Trading Partners, joining us for a look at the number here. Bob, as I take a look, initially it looks like uh, it came in a little bit higher than expect me. Correct me if I'm wrong. Expected, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm looking at you, Ben, so I don't see the number right now. I mean, I could look away, but I think that would be rude. <laughs> no. So, we but based to... <laughs> on the expectations, yeah, you're looking at 0. 0.6 month over month versus an estimate of 0. 0.4. Um, I would, you know, Phil mentioned it, and I was listening to your interview with Phil, who's a friend of mine, and, and he mentioned that uh, they expected to be a little bit high end of the range because of the holiday, and I expect the same thing. One of the things that I'm paying attention to based on this number and based on what this number is likely to look like going forward is we're seeing consumer credit start to get above pre-pandemic levels. Credit card delinquency starting to hit levels very similar to before the great financial crisis. So this to me kind of lines up with that. You know, you and I talked about some of the larger numbers um, in the buy now, pay later space that were happening going up to the holiday. Now, the difference with that is uh, the, the actual name, the company, uh, buy now, pay later, they don't charge interest, but credit cards do. And credit card interest rates, unless you're on some sort of a deal, are running between 18 and 20% now. So this has the potential to slow consumers a little bit. This retail sales number may not necessarily be a positive looking at the strength of the consumer within the economy, but we don't know that just from this number. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a positive here for the bulls either at this point. Small downtick in terms of uh, reaction to the S&Ps from around 47.77, 47.78. We're now, well, okay, 47.75, maybe not a big deal. But I did see a new high in the U.S. dollar. You got yields at 4.10 for the 10-year. I just want to take a look at this number here, a little bit closer look. It did come in higher than expected at 0.6%. Expectations were for 0.4 prior 0.3. That's month over month for retail sales. Uh, X autos here coming at 0.6 in line with prior levels here. Import export prices, uh, Bob. How much attention are you giving this one here? It looks like import prices coming at 0.0. Looks like exports came in significantly lower. Or, I'm sorry, lower than expected, down 0.9. Uh, also in line with prior levels, they were down around 1% last month. Yeah, not much at all, to be honest. The import-export numbers have quite a bit to do with uh, longer-term trends in the dollar as much as they do with actual economic activity, although I will say that export numbers have been slightly soft if you look at them on a three-month annualized basis, which tells you that the rest of the globe may be weakening a little bit quicker than the U.S. is. And if you take that in the context of this retail sales number and the reaction in the bond markets, you mentioned that 4.10, I'm now seeing 4.11 on the 10 year, it may have pulled back since then, but that's about four basis points higher than it was prior to the number. And about, if, if you look at all of last week, the drop that we had in the 10 year note last week is not only made up, but we've, uh, we've, um, Going a little bit farther yeah, to the upside, to the right? Upside, we surpassed yeah. it. Yeah, is the word I was looking for. Thank you for that. We surpassed it uh, by almost double if you count the high today. So we're seeing yields go higher, and that's why it's not necessarily a positive for the bulls in the stock market. If you look at the probabilities on the CME Fed Watch tool, for about two weeks they had actually seven consecutive 25 basis point rate cuts priced into the market as the highest probability. Okay, not a high probability, but the highest of all probabilities. And now we're down to six again, yeah. which is still a, a little unbelievable on my side of things, but still less than it was a while ago. And even the probability of a March rate cut has dropped by about 10%. It was about 97%. And once it's down about 87% as of this morning. And that's based on a little bit stronger economy, which these retail sales numbers point to. Yeah, I think the market pulling back here uh, over the last couple of weeks, an indication of how uh, investors, well, we maybe got a little bit too far over our skis in terms of some of those expectations yeah. for rate cuts. Getting back to your earlier point here, Bob, about uh, the consumer retail sales and uh, credit cards, ultimately, are you seeing any other areas in the economy where we're seeing kind of some faltering, some concerning uh, um, kind of uh, shoots, so to say, because we still have really strong labor conditions here in the U.S., or maybe that's been overstated in some ways? Well, labor lags, 
right? So if you look at, again, three-month annualized numbers in, say, the non-farm payrolls, they're still strong, but they're tilted in the direction of slowing, all right? They've been it, revised. Every single uh, non-farm payrolls number has been revised lower except for one over the last 12 months. Now, it's not that that matters. That happens in stretches, and it isn't necessarily something that you can position your investments off, off of. But it does seem to point in the direction of the economy. So we have these things that go in streaks. When they start to revise non-farm payrolls number higher, that's usually because payrolls are doing a little better in its underlying trend. And when they're revising them lower, it's the opposite. And you have to see several months of lower revisions to actually kind of make that assumption. And we have seen that. The second thing I would say is, talking about credit card delinquencies, overall consumer credit delinquencies are starting to rise. They're not as troubling as credit card delinquencies are. Like for example, car loan uh, delinquencies and repossessions are starting to climb higher. Now they're nowhere near where they were at their peak, but remember that even during the great financial crisis, car payments were paid while houses and property were being repossessed. Mm. And that's simply because obviously it's a lower payment and you need your car to get to work. So the thing I'm most concerned with going forward in terms of the U.S. economy is jobs. When you look at a situation like people are comfortable, the mortgage delinquencies, for example, are not happening. They're not rising. And that's simply because so many people refinanced at or near the lows that they're not uncomfortable yet. But if they start to lose their jobs, no matter what the mortgage payment is, the mortgage payment becomes cumbersome. So you'll see that first in terms of existing home sale inventories. That's where you'll see that. And that'll come after job losses start to stack up if that actually happens. So I think this might be part of the reason that the Fed pivoted and why the markets hope they pivot a little faster than the SEP or the dot plots as we call them, say they will, <clears throat> simply to avoid that situation where job losses turn into home losses and turn into a recession or a full on consumer crisis. Well, that's also uh, one of the concerns we raised at the top of the show, right? If the Fed's cutting, ultimately, what's the reason behind it? And that kind of makes me think a little bit about, you mentioned crude oil, hanging out around $70 a barrel. I mean, we always talk about, yeah, we like to see lower energy prices, prices at the pump on the decline, but not necessarily, Bob, if it's tied to a weakening economy, correct? Yeah, absolutely. If it's demand weakness, it's an issue. Now, right now, we've kind of got a blend of the two. But remember, as manufacturing weakens, one of the places that we see weak manufacturing bleed into is energy. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if you're not running a factory, then the electricity is not on, right? The natural gas isn't being used to warm the factory in the winter. Now, obviously, we're not seeing that as of now. Plus, the, it, the Chips and, and uh, Jobs Act, which is filled with tons and tons of pork, still did give capital to privates to uh, private companies private uh, the private sector to invest and when you give money to the private sector is does get invested especially if it's not their own money right so you look at for example ford on their electrification it's interesting to see what might happen by the way with electric vehicles going forward considering all the parking lots filled with dead electric vehicles because of the cold you guys have seen up there um, so all of that is is a positive for the economy overall but not a positive for the inflation to your original point is mm -hmm. why would the fed cut rates as much as the market expects them to when you still have an unemployment rate at about 3.8% and you still have consumer spending at a 0.6 clip on the retail sales. That's why we want to look at the next couple of months of retail sales. Well, I think that's going to continue the focus on the data as well and uh, the discussion going in terms of expectations in reaction to the numbers here. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, Bob. Appreciate you joining us here uh, this Wednesday. Bob Iacino, founder, chief strategist of Path Trading Partners.